Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Um, thanks for joining us on this Thursday uh, for us and here in the West Coast of the United States. It's 7 a.m. Um, and thank you for joining us early for us. Uh, it's so good to see you all. And I'm here with the one and only Jack, and we're so excited to nerd out on some medicine. Anybody has a case that they want to present? As I chug my coffee. Any case is a good learning case, I promise. Hi, Robbie. Good to see you here. Hello, how are you? Good. Morning, Robbie. Good morning. <laughs> uh, Rafa, yeah, that would be great if you have a case that you want to present. That's awesome. Thank you, Rafa. We understand for those of you for who it's early, it's hard to it's hard to synthesize a case this at this time of the day. Yeah, this is already better than Jack and I thought like it would just be me and him today. Yeah. <laughs> Talking medicine. So you all are here. So thank you for being here. I was ready to present Charmina case and then have her solve it too. <laughs> solve it back to me. Uh all right, um, Thomas, thank you so much for subscribing. If you want to share the whiteboard, then Rafa can start presenting. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is a 66 year old woman uh, presenting with watery diarrhea. I'm going to give you a little bit of background related to the diarrhea. This diarrhea started uh, three weeks ago. Initially, it was like three episodes, um, but now it's like eight episodes per day. Um, she described the diarrhea being watery with occasional pink streaking and no frank blood. Uh, the patient also says that it's associated with abdominal cramping. Um, there is no relation to food intake, no ill contact. And uh, the last information that I'll give you is that it occurs at night and during the day. And that's the end of the article. All right. Well, we have a great start here where um, I think that this is actually a really fun space to find ourselves in because we're actually between stages of somebody who has diarrhea. For those of you who may have joined us for other VMRs where we've started off with the chief concern of diarrhea, you'll recall that really our important branch point in, um, uh, in thinking about an individual who, who is presenting with diarrhea is to answer the question of what is the tempo of this illness. We can define diarrhea as acute diarrhea or chronic diarrhea. And that temporal label really matters because it alters the pretest probability of the different underlying etiologies. Acute diarrhea, number one, two, and three on the DDX is going to be infection, infection, infection. Oftentimes, this is going to be something like a viral gastroenteritis. And occasionally, we can also see bacterial gastroenteritis leading to diarrhea, which is usually going to be from some of the classic enteric organisms that we might think about, things like E. coli, Klebsiella, Shigella, Campylobacter, and things of that nature. But chronic diarrhea, it shifts. And we have to sort of think about prioritizing not only infections, which can still be there, but also thinking about non-infectious causes of diarrhea. And so the question is, well, when, when, when can we start to switch from acute diarrhea to chronic diarrhea? In the literature, you'll see that 
that this is oftentimes driven, drawn as a line in the sand. If it exists for less than four weeks, we think about it as acute to subacute. And if it exists for more than four weeks, we'll start to think about it as chronic. But as we know in medicine, right, there aren't really line, lines in the sand. These things exist on a spectrum, right? And so at the three week mark here, right, we're getting closer and closer to chronic diarrhea. And I will say that more often than not, right, most infectious causes of acute diarrhea resolve within anywhere from one to two weeks or something like that. So the fact that we're getting more into the close to the three week time zone, is making me think I'm gonna prioritize a chronic diarrhea approach, but still hang on to the acute diarrhea DDS in the back of my mind because both of these have to be at play. Charmaine, so, I mean, what are your thoughts here? What else, what else would you add here in terms of thinking about this sort of underlying maybe chronic diarrhea? Oh, I, that was so well said, um, Jack, thanks. Yeah, uh, so I think what I'm gonna do is I just expand on that chronic diarrhea a little bit more, uh, knowing that we're on that cusp uh, so this patient is having kind of watery diarrhea. She's having um, nightly symptoms as well. And so I'm not getting a flavor of inflammatory diarrheas yet. Um, although, you know, we can't really, really say there's no inflam inflammation yet. We need to work up more because inflammatory diarrhea is, you know, usually like uh, you can get like a blood in it, uh, you know, like that's your IBD, uh, like invasive infections. Uh, I'll keep that in the back of our mind. And I'm curious in this patient about non-inflammatory diarrhea. So whether it's like secretory, osmotic, fatty or functional, not getting a fatty flavor as much. Osmotic usually improves with fasting. So the fact that this is happening at night is pushing me more to either like a secretory or functional diarrhea. However, like all of these lists are expensive. And I think kind of getting a better sense of who this person is and getting some uh, like lab work um, would be helpful. But that's where my head is at right now. Oh, actually, oh, thanks, uh, Sayed. I didn't see the pink streaking. That is really helpful. You're absolutely right. So if that is like kind of blood, then thinking more about like inflammatory causes. I didn't see that. Thanks, friend. Appreciate it. All right, Rafa, why don't you hit us with some more data? Okay, Na very nice discussion as usual. Uh, so this patient has been experiencing fatigue anorexia and weight loss for two weeks. Um, she also said there's no uh, fevers, chills, night sweats, and we review all systems um, otherwise negative. She just complains of the fatigue, anorexia, weight loss for two weeks besides the diarrhea. When it comes to the best medical history, this patient has hypertension. Uh, she's on lysinopril, 20 milligrams, she denies using over-the-counter medications for herbal supplements. She lives in Texas, urban Texas, no travel history. She's a school teacher. Uh, she had this um, last sexual encounter months prior. It was unprotected. She doesn't smoke. She drinks socially. Uh, there is no drug use and no gum or cervical use. Uh, do you want a physical exam as well? Okay. Um, temperature, 98 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so heart rate, 100. Blood pressure, 112 over 56. Uh, respiratory weight 20, and she's saturating 100% on room air. She appears weak and tired. Uh, her mucosa is dry. Her abdomen is soft and tender throughout. Her rectal exam uh, shows external hemorrhoids. Her uh, higher exam reveals regular rate and wisdom, no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. The lungs are clear to auscultation, and the joint, skin, eyes were all normal. And that's the end of the audio clock. All right. Uh, thanks, Rafa. 
I'll just comment on the past history and then leave the physical exam to the wonderful Jack. Um, so in terms of like past medical history, not much there, um, just history of hypertension, lisinopril, um, I don't know, have any associations with the diarrhea in my mind. Um, and I think the fact that the information about the supplement is incredibly helpful, uh, especially if there are patients like taking any over-the-counter medications. So, um, you know, a medication side effect, usually uh, with medications that cause like kind of chronic diarrhea, we think more like uh, 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 like immunotherapies uh, for cancer treatment that like she doesn't have. Um, in terms of like her social history, being a school teacher, I, I would be curious about what age, you know, if she is hanging out with like a bunch of young kiddos, you know, uh, thinking about like the infection that she could get from uh, exposure in school. Um, however, three weeks is a long time. The other possibility to always think about is, you know, um, if that the diagnosis, the, um, uh, the etiology has changed, like if she had like a norovirus and then after that developed like a functional or like an osmotic diarrhea, um, after that, like, you know, some people can become intol lactose intolerant um, after uh, illnesses. Um, so something to consider, but less likely. And in terms of like hair exposures, uh, in terms of like having an unprotected uh, sex a couple of months ago, and I think to uh, think about are, you know, um, it, it's important to kind of get a better sense of that sexual history if it was like, you know, um, anal, or vaginal sex, and you know if there's any reason to be concerned about um, like an underlying um, infectious, like you know HIV exposures, or like if uh, anal sex was involved CMV, uh, if she's immunocompetent, uh, immuno the CMV would cause like usually pain, uh, but you know in, in HIV patients, it can definitely cause like uh, watery diarrhea. So something you think about, uh, especially if it's been a couple of months, uh, six months ago, um, then we might have to just kind of keep that in the back of our mind. All right, Jack, what am I missing? What do you have to add? Oh gosh, I don't know that you're missing that you're missing anything at all. That was absolutely phenomenal. Um, I think, you know, the, the exam helps us take Things a step further that you mentioned in terms of your in terms of the in terms of the hypothesis about the possible exposure history. I think the two things that feel like the most predominantly valuable to me on the physical exam right now are the heart rate and the abdominal tenderness, as well as the general appearance of of um, of this individual. And I think what these data do is they start to paint the picture of an underlying syndrome of inflammatory diarrhea. So I think we're sort of inching closer and closer to beginning to start to characterize that. Now the question is, well, what, what are the actual data points that, that give us a signature of inflammation and why do they tell us that? I will say that the heart rate of 100 in somebody who has had ongoing diarrhea for weeks is an alarm system, is, is um, something that I'm, that I'm taking note of. Um, individuals, if somebody has an acute diarrhea and has a lot of volume loss, there may be a component of hypovolemia associated with that. And that hypovolemia could persist over weeks. So that's one hypothesis around the tachycardia is are we, is, are we dealing with underlying hypovolemia and volume loss? However, the I think more probable or at least another coexisting contributor here is some, is some sort of underlying inflammatory process, right? We had some initial in, information of that with the pink streaks on the paper that tells us that maybe something within the GI tract is irritated and causing some bleeding. But we don't want to be fooled by the fact that that could also just be from the external hemorrhoids that this individual has, right? So that 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 could explain the pink streaking, but there also could be something further up in the GI tract that's leading to the blood. But if I say tachycardia, fatigue, anorexia, someone who appears weak and tired, right? We'll abstract that picture into a syndrome of inflammation. And then the question is, well, how are we going to now pursue the possibility of an inflammatory diarrhea workup? And there's five categories to think about when we think about an inflammatory diarrhea. The first is going to be thinking about those infections. And again, we talked about initially that we can still think about the common acute infections that may be lingering with a tail. So things like a, um, a GI viral panel and a PCR panel that can pick up many of the common enteroviruses, but also we can look for some of the common bacteria. Again, Campylobacter, E. coli, Shigella, and some of those other organisms. But again, as we get into the weeks and weeks, we're going to start to think about other atypical and more indolent chronic diarrhea infections. And that's going to be the things that 
We might see like, for example, parasites, although we don't have a great exposure history for that. Um, uh, uh, opportunistic viral infections like Charmaine mentioned, right? We don't have quite a great sense of what the underlying host immune status is. And then some atypical bacteria, for example, mycobacteria can be sometimes thrown into the list, right? But once we move through the infectious causes, which we're gonna evaluate first, the four other categories that we can think about are autoimmune, malignancy, and then in some cases, individuals can have medication exposures, for example, radio, um, radiation or immunotherapy, which we don't see which we don't see here. So I think at this point, we're gonna prioritize the infections, consider the possibility of there being underlying IBD, and then in somebody who's in their 60s, also thinking about malignancy as well. And then if we move through that inflammatory bucket, there are some secretory causes of diarrhea that can give an inflammatory-like picture. For example, things like microscopic colitis or other perineoplastic syndromes, um, but we won't talk about those in too much detail yet. So again, where are we gonna go from here? The tools that we have at our disposal are gonna be stool studies to look for infections and to understand if there's any other signs of inflammation like a fecal calprotectin level. We have cross-sectional imaging so we can see what part of the GI tract is potentially inflamed. And then ultimately, if neither of those give us the answer, we're gonna get direct visualization of the GI mucosa with a colonoscopy to potentially take biopsies and also see what our appearances there. So that's kind of how I would prioritize, again, our approach, but then also the tools that we have to move through to get to the underlying answer here. Rafa, I'm dying to know what comes next. <laughs> uh, incredible discussion frames. Um, so the initial labs, the white blood cell was 9.4 with a normal different ratio. The hemoglobin was 9.3 with a MCV of 83. And the platelets were um, 533,000. Uh, the sodium was 138. The potassium was 3.2. The chloride was 95. Uh, CO2, 30. BUM, 11. Creatinine, 0 0.6. And the glucose was 103. Uh, the TSH, lipase, bilirubin, AST, ALT were all within normal limits. And the HIV was negative. And that's the end of the article. Oh, I'm going to give you just one more. The ESR was 199, 119, sorry. And the CRP was 80. And the stool cow protecting was. Wow, 9,926. And the normal is up to 60, so very elevated. And that's the end of the other quad. All right. Well, I will take a talk sort of through some of these initial general, general labs here, and then I'll leave some of the more focused and targeted information um, uh, to Charmin to take us through. Um, I think before moving on to that, I just want to express some gratitude to Hadi for helping me to remember that, yes, I absolutely should have mentioned celiac disease in that, in, in that, um, in that initial approach. Epidemiologically, it is quite a common cause of, of, uh, of chronic diarrhea, um, uh, and it's certainly something that can also have an inflammatory signature as well. So thank you so much for reminding us of that, again, shaking off the morning the morning cobwebs this morning, and I'm very grateful for the team that we have here to help us move, to help us move, move through our DDX. But yeah, I would say for sure we, we can add celiac disease to that inflammatory diarrhea approach, and it can sort of sit under the autoimmune category along with, with the other inflammatory bowel diseases like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. In terms of the labs here, I think the labs, again, continue to paint a picture of a signature of underlying inflammation, right? We have anemia and what seems like a borderline elevated, um, uh, borderline elevated to elevated platelet count here um, in somebody who's had sort of chronic, chronic indolent symptoms. Does that change the calculus in a substantial way from that initial DDX that, that, that we gave? Not so much. I think, you know, um, uh, if anything, it maybe takes some of those sort of common acute underlying causes of infectious diarrhea puts them a little bit lower in my mind, but many of the more indolent causes of chronic diarrhea, for example, things like mycobacterial infections or parasite infections are certainly there. The anemia could be due to blood loss from this inflammatory diarrhea, right? right? We see pink, pink streaking in, in the stools. 
And again, whenever we see thrombocytosis like that in an underlying um, or in an, um, uh, somebody who is sort of in the elderly age range, we have to continue to entertain the possibility of underlying malignancy, whether that is a GI-based malignancy like colon cancer or a lymphoproliferative disorder that can have manifestations in the GI tract, for example, like a lymphoma. Um, in terms of the BMP and everything, um, you know, I think um, uh, uh, there's nothing that's really grabbing my attention too much. And so in the interest of time, I'll turn it over to Charmaine um, uh, uh, to tell us, you know, what are you thinking about some of these other results here with the ESR, CRP, and all that other stuff? As you astutely put it together during the last aliqua, inflammation, 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 inflammation. Um, so both the ESR and CRP uh, being elevated and silicate protection, again, is a measure of um, inflammation. Um, so we know uh, this, um, uh, this woman is having um, inflammatory diarrhea. So then the question becomes what? Um, and I think at this point, um, thinking about like, hey, how do we get to the bottom of this? And um, I do wonder, like taking a good look, um, you know, we know IBD has like bimodal distribution. So is, is this is IBD that we're dealing with? Is it a chronic inf uh, infection? I would still like, you know, send an HIV test on this um, a woman as well. Um, so um, I think at this point, it's just like kind of getting a sample. You, your differential was beautiful. Um, so I'm not going to repeat that. Um, and I think one thing Ravi pointed out uh, astutely is that, you know, someone that we uh, see with like chronic diarrhea, we would expect a, a non anion gap metabolic acidosis. And uh, here's bicarb is 30, which doesn't quite fit. And he made a great point of, you know, laxative abuse plus diarrhea can do it. So, um, you know, this person is having like a mixed acid base disorder as well. So keep an eye on that um, going forward too. But yeah, I will, will pass the mic back to Rafa. Amazing. I really love the pearl about the biomodal distribution. Because sometimes we forget about it, right? Like you just try to diagnose IBD in young patients. Thank you, Charmaine, for the reminder. Um, infectious two studies, um, CD, PCR were, was negative. The infectious diarrhea to PCR panel was also negative. And the stool open and parasite exam was also negative. And there's just one more aliqua that will kind of reveal the diagnosis. Go for it, Charmise. Oh, you know, I think at this point is like kind of process of elimination so we can uh, do it together. So I think, you know, uh, getting a CETA, it's never a bad idea, uh, especially if this patient is hospitalized and you want to protect other patients if you have suspicion for it. Um, however, like it's more acute on presentations and it, and the other PCR testing being negative. So like infection overall is like a little less likely. So kind of thinking about like our other um, ideologies, thinking about like malignancies, IBD. Um, so I, I think I'm kind of getting a more flavor of an IBD, thinking like it needs a colonoscopy with pathology, um, uh, pathology uh, to, um, for us to diagnose this. Uh, one thing that I can't remember, uh, Jack, I don't know if you remember with like microscopic colitis, does, it doesn't have an elevated cal protected, does it? Um, I can't remember that. Oof, that is also a question that I would not be able to confidently answer on the fly like this. It's yeah. a great question. Yeah. So that's the other thing. I feel like a microscopic colitis is also like sneaks up, uh, has sneaked up on me and it causes a really significant diarrhea, nightly symptoms. And sometimes like it just gets better on its own, like flares up again. Um, but that's another thing in terms of like secretary ones that I'm thinking about. Uh, so what are your thoughts, Jack? I completely, yeah. I completely agree with you. I think um, uh, uh, epidemiologically prioritizing IBD, and I love that you brought in microscopic colitis into the fold here, because I think from a reasoning perspective, like we might expect to see certain things on the colonoscopy with IBD, like UC or Crohn's, but also preparing for the fact that what if we don't see those classic findings? Where are we gonna? Where are we going to go from there? So sort of the forcing function, I think, is a phenomenal reasoning pearl here. Like this is what we expect to see, and if we see something unexpected, we also know where to potentially take that. 
Um, and thanks, uh, thanks to the amazing Ravi for looking it up. And uh, microscopic colitis can present with elevated fecal cal protectant. So um, I think about what I would tell you, my next step would be asking our wonderful DI colleagues to get a colonoscopy. Uh, so that is my final diagnosis, Rafa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my brain, you're absolutely right. So a colonoscopy was ordered and it showed the superficial and deep ulcerations throughout the column with normal appear intervening muc mucosa. And that's the end of the article. All right, let's kick it. Let's kick it back and forth again. Rocco, where did you say this was, this was found throughout the colon? Yes, it, it was found throughout the column and there were like normal appearing mucosa between the areas affected. All right, so it sounds like what you're telling me is that we are, we are dealing with skip lesions here on the colonoscopy findings. And we have sort of ulcerations with skip lesions throughout the parts of the GI tract that we could visualize. I think the fact that we have the superficial, the deep ulcerations and the skip lesion, that sort of activates an illness script for Crohn's disease, in my mind, that we would be thinking about, right? Um, acknowledging that Crohn's ultimately is gonna have to be made as a histopathologic diagnosis where we would see things like granulomatous inflammation, but certainly Crohn's is a disease, the process that can affect anywhere from the mouth to the anus. Um, and it'll be characterized by oftentimes transmural inflammation, as well as skip lesions along the way. So I think based off of the data that we have here and the base rate of disease, and like Charmaine talked about the fact that we can have, um, the fact that we can have um, a bimodal distribution of IBD with it presenting in an elderly person, um, uh, my, my brain is going towards Crohn's disease, but I'll be honest with the group here. Um, this is a space that I haven't revisited for quite some time. And so I feel a little bit rusty in terms of, in, in terms of the nuanced interpretation of, of, um, of uh, colonoscopy findings. It's something that I wasn't comfortable with before and certainly still feel a lot of, a lot of uncertainty about now. So I'm sort of feeling guarded and saying that, it, that, that, that that's definitely what it is. Um, so I'm curious, Charmaine, what's this, um, uh, what, what are your thoughts here? Because I think it has a Crohn's flavor to it, but I'm also acknowledging that there's probably a lot of unknown unknowns for me at this point. Yeah, I think that, um, I absolutely agree. I think on top of the differential diagnosis for me is Crohn's given her presentation. Um, you know, like everything, ulcerations can, um, uh, you know, what else can cause ulcerations? Um, the other things to think about, like, you know, vasculitides, uh, like brochettes or stuff like that can mimic IBD. Um, he, she doesn't have any extra, doesn't sound like any extra um, colonic uh, manifestations at this point, but like making sure to look at her mouth to make sure she doesn't have any mouth ulcerations as well. Uh, but, I, you know, I think um, you can say like IBD has different, um, like IBD can have mimickers, but I think at this point, I personally would just like wait until the pathology comes back. And if it's not Crohn's, I'll go back digging. Uh, but yeah, I think it's like pretty consistent with IBD. Um, that's my working diagnosis as well. Rafa? Very both times. So uh, the skip lesions, which was the non-continuous involvement that just like I discussed, on colonoscopy favored Crohn's over ulcerative colitis and biopsy showed chronic active colitis with crypt abscess and fissuring ulcers consistent with Crohn's disease. There was no evidence of CMV infection. This patient was started on steroids and subsequently on adalimumab. I just wanted to share a pearl that I really like here that elevated fecal cow protecting lactoferrin and leukocytes also just intestinal inflammation but do not differentiate infection from autoimmune processes. And the sensitivity of elevated fecal cow protecting in patients with IBG is near 90% and is also used to track disease activity and response to treatment. And that's the end of the article. Rafa, thanks for presenting. Such a fantastic case to think through. So uh, yeah, uh, 
and I think like what I love about these is like starting with like a common complaints that we see like chronic diarrhea and then like you know IBD is also not rare and having to like kind of walk through those differentials I just always like find it so helpful um and yeah and I think like with chronic like watery diarrhea from the get-go I had trouble like based on just the HPI to distinguish whether this is inflammatory and non-inflammatory so again like you know, keeping those uh, not anchoring and just like keeping those differentials open. Uh, thanks to Jack. Uh, it's really important. So that's my little cognitive autopsy for today. Uh, um, Madalena, uh, thank you so much for doing teaching points. And Rafa, thanks for presenting Promise. Thank you so much for scribing and all of you for joining us. Take us home, Madalena. Awesome. Well, this was such a great way to start the day. <laughs> um, so Rafa, yes, thank you for presenting a case and Charmaine and Jack, just really, really a phenomenal discussion. Uh, so to jump into teaching points, we got the chief concern of diarrhea and Jack walked us through that a really important branch point is tempo. So we really wanna think about, can we bucket this into acute versus chronic? And we had this really interesting discussion where at what point do we transition from acute to chronic diarrhea? And we learned that in the literature, they often suggest that less than four weeks can be subacute, greater than four weeks can be chronic. But for our patient, we had three weeks. So we actually wanted to consider both chronic and subacute causes. Um, and because we wanted to uh, consider acute causes, we uh, discussed that you need to prioritize infection for acute diarrhea. So this can be viral or bacterial gastroenteritis, so bugs like E. coli, Klebsiella, Shigella. Uh, for chronic diarrhea, you actually want to consider both prioritize, uh, you want to prioritize both infectious and non-infectious. So a helpful branch point can be inflammatory versus non-inflammatory diarrhea. But as Charmaine discussed, it can actually be difficult to identify um, really to confidently put yourself in one of those buckets. So some um, signs that make you want to prioritize inflammatory causes can be things like pink streaks, which is what we saw on this patient. And some of the differential includes IBD, celiac disease, also other infectious causes. And then for non-inflammatory diarrhea, you can think of um, both secretory and osmotic causes. And um, for an osmotic diarrhea that generally improves with fasting. Um, when we got the past medical history, we considered some infectious exposures from her occupation as a school teacher and prior unprotected sex. And then when we got the exam, this really indicated this underlying syndrome of inflammation given the tachycardia that they were presenting with. Um, we talked about the workup for inflammatory diarrhea, including stool studies and fecal calprotectin. Um, and for labs, this also kind of reassured us that this was um, a signature of inflammation, including the anemia, the thrombocytosis, the elevated stool calprotectin. Uh, and ultimately, with further workup of the colonoscopy with biopsy, this really made us um, have a working diagnosis of Crohn's disease, given the transmural inflammation and the skip lesions. And Charmaine reminded us that IBD can have this bimodal uh, distribution. But ultimately, we learned that you need histopathology to uh, really confirmed the diagnosis of Crohn's disease where you would see granulomas. And lastly, always, always consider some mimics like Bichette's disease and others. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. That was brilliant, Madalena. Thank you so much. Uh, the, just like all of you, the way you guys can just so succinctly and thoughtfully put together the teaching points every single time like blows my mind. I don't think I can do it. Um, thank you all. Really appreciate it. Have a good one. See you tomorrow.